Uh, first of all, welcome to all of you, wherever you may be, whatever time zone you may be in, a very, very warm welcome. Um, I am Dr. Pallavi Roy. I'm a senior lecturer in international economics at CISD. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, senior lecturer, Dr. Harold Hubong. He will have a few words to say, and he'll also introduce himself. He's the climate star and the climate czar at, at CISD, and so as, and, and we've been colleagues for a very, very long time. So very warm welcome. It is rather unfortunate that we can't do this face to face. It's, it's you know, there's, there's always, this is a day that as, as uh, academics, we really look forward to. We love the buzz. We love the energy in the room when all of you come trooping in with, with, with so many questions that you have. But equally, uh, we look at the positive side of it. Uh, many of you who wouldn't have been able to make it are here with us today, maybe with your cup of coffee or tea or, or, or your bowl of cereals. So again, we're, we're very happy that we can actually reach out to you, to all of you who wouldn't normally have been able to make it to our sort of on-campus uh, taster session. Um, what makes CISD special? What makes SOAS special? Uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've been a SOAS product. I came to SOAS after 10 years as a financial journalist in South Asia. I came to SOAS to do um, a master's. I, I stuck around. I, I went out to the private sector, worked for a bit. Then I decided to come back and do a PhD at SOAS. And then I just couldn't leave. It's 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 really that, that kind of a place. It sort of does that to you. Um, if, if, if one can say that London is sort of the center of the academic universe, so as is sort of at the center of London, where we're, you know, right there with the British Museum next to us, uh, a wonderful environment, you can walk to, to many beautiful places, uh, a, a lot of cultural hotspots, social hotspots, whatever you want. So, so as is special, we, we do talk about um, we do talk about the Middle East, we do talk about Asia, we do talk about Africa, we do talk about a lot of developing contexts, keeping them front and center. I think that's what makes SOAS very, very special. There are other universities, of course, that, that talk about uh, developing countries, but we, we look at development as a, in a particular framework where developing countries are really front and center. What are their problems? Where do developed countries come in in terms of solving those problems? And we see it from a myriad of frameworks. You pick your framework and then, then CISD. CISD is extremely interesting because we are genuinely one of the few multidisciplinary centers at the school. So you might learn diplomacy, which you will if you do join CISD, and we hope you do. Uh, but you will learn it from a you know, variety of perspectives. You can learn it from... Um, you can, you can uh, take on courses that are legal. You can take on courses that, that have climate in them. You can take on courses that have economics in them. Uh, you can take on courses that, of course, are much more tuned to a, a diplomatic career. And um, that's the reason why CISD is, is actually very special. And you know, our, our topic for today is uh, diplomacy in the 21st century, upskilling for that. Harold, do you think we can have the slides up? You're, you're the tech person. So are you figuring it out? You're on mute. You're on mute is the line of the century, isn't it? This is, this is what we've always said all the time. I didn't uh -huh. really have anything interesting to say. I was just uh, sort of mumbling to myself. So I'm going to <laughs> we'll try. try. And we'll try and make it interesting for you guys. Let's see. Um, I've got the PowerPoint here, but... Uh... You, you figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll talk. Yeah, you, you keep on. I'll, I'll talk to okay. our guests in the meantime. Yes. Um, so that's that's uh, CISD for you. Most of you have probably done your homework, Center for International Studies and Diplomacy. We offer uh, two campus courses, the, the uh, ISD course and the Global uh, Energy and Climate Policy course, which uh, Harold uh, convenes. And we also have, of course, uh, a roster of courses online, which includes courses like Global Corporations and Policy uh, and, and a whole host of other, other uh, courses. Next slide, Harold. Okay, and when we said global challenges, uh, diplomacy in the 21st century, you know, diplomacy no longer just means uh, uh, stuffy old shirts sitting in, in, a, in a room with mahogany and oak and, and smoking pipes and, and having cognac and deciding where to put the pins on a, on a world map. And it's really moved very, very far away from there. It, it's also not just about negotiating during war. Uh, it, it's about how to keep the peace and uh, how to keep a sustainable peace how to keep a peace that's progressive, and most importantly for the 21st century, 
you need to also understand a lot of other aspects of what is going on around the world. I mean, look, just look at how the world has changed in the past one year. Did, did any of us think that this would really hit us like a bolt from the blue? But overnight, diplomats have had to learn the language of an epidemiologist. Uh, do you keep international borders open? What international borders do you keep open? Whose international borders and who do you allow to come in? Uh, what about vaccines? If I get my vaccine from this country, uh, what protocols am I breaking? Am I breaking something that the World Trade Organization says shouldn't be done? Um, and if I hoard too many vaccines, is this good? Is it good for me as a soft power? You know, something, a question that let's say the United Kingdom is grappling with or India and China are saying, well, we're sending vaccines to developing countries. Suddenly, diplomacy has an epidemiological slant. It's, it's not something that any, any diplomat was, was trained to deal with. So you really need to have to learn on the job. And we believe at CISD, we can equip you for that. Whatever the 21st century challenge is, and we've got it lined up here, you definitely have the sustainable development goals. You've moved on from the millennium development goals. You're now moving on to the sustainable development goals. And as a diplomat, a lot of countries, whether you are in the developed world or in the developing world, the SDGs are front and center of what you want to achieve for your country, for your region, for your neighborhood, and indeed whatever block you might be sitting on, a uh, trade block that you might be sitting on or political block that you might be sitting on. So trade becomes very important. Livelihoods becomes very important. The language of the agreements that binds together becomes very important. So that's the legal structure for you. Climate change, and, and Harold will talk much more uh, to climate change. Climate change is of course, you know, you can, you can link what's been happening uh, with the pandemic and how it started and why we have uh, the kind of situation that we have today. You can link it to climate change and climate policy. All of this is actually extremely interlinked. So you are not just a diplomat learning diplomatic skills. You have to learn a host of other skills. And here's where it gets interesting. You might learn it from a, a program that teaches you diplomacy, but you can deploy the learnings in any sector. You can actually go work at a think tank after this. You don't have to be a diplomat. You can work in an NGO. You can, you can work in CSR because corporate social uh, responsibility, that is. Because if you know the language of what a corporation wants to talk about, if you know the language of a trade deal, you can actually do a lot more in terms of helping companies formulate policy. You can become an academic. That's what a lot of us wanted to do. But we are also practicing academics. That's what we like calling it. Harold does a lot of very, very grounded work. Uh, uh, as a climate policy expert, as, as an economist and a political economist. I do a lot of work with some wonderful colleagues in SOAS, and I'll come, come to that. So it is all about the skills that we provide you, which you can actually transfer. It's not about just being a diplomat. It'll be great if you do that. It's a great life. Um, but you can also, also transfer those skills into any other sector that you, that you might want to uh, uh, move into. So that's, that's a very, very uh, interesting thing about uh, this, this particular course. Of course, if you're interested in international studies, particularly in diplomacy, we give you the skills to do that, but there are also transferable skills. So we, we teach you about uh, issues to do with human rights law. We teach you about issues to do with, uh, so if a multinational corporation is, is um, uh, investing in, in, let's say, Kenya. What does it mean for Kenya? Or does the multinational corporation walk away with it? You know, there are no black and white answers in this world. And, you know, as a student, we tend to see, and I've, I've, you know, we've all been there, done that. We've been students uh, some time ago. And, and you do tend to see the world in a black and white. But when you go out there, especially in diplomacy, you have to handle a host of nuances. And that host of nuances is something that we try and give you when we talk about, uh, when we teach you our modules at CISD, there is a gray scale and you need to engage with arguments and debates at all ends of the scale. You can't have a diplomacy which is, uh, you know, uh, you're holding a gun to somebody's head. That's, that's the last resort, if at all it's a resort. Um, so it's, it's, it's that perspective that we give you. We, our, our approach is critical. Our approach is heterodox, which means we, we, we take from all sources. Uh, we teach you what the mainstream is, where required, we, with our experience, we teach you how to critique it. Then, of course, we have our opinions, but it's for you to synthesize and process it because you're coming in as master students. You already have a worldview out there. 
we probably help you finesse it uh, a lot more. And then there's a lot that you can soak up from SOAS. It's not just, as I said, it's not just CISD. There are a lot of other interesting departments uh, where they have interesting uh, events apart from, from what we do. So, so th there are a lot of you know, layers that you can add on to what you do at, so at CISD. But this is, this is pretty much, um, let's say, a summary of how, how we introduce you to the world of, uh, world of diplomacy. It's, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, it, it's nuanced and it allows you to create your own perspective and we are always there to help you along in, in creating that perspective. I think that's that's extremely, extremely important uh, at CISD. I will also quickly talk about some of the, the extremely groundbreaking research that we do. Uh, CISD is one of the few uh, centers or departments at SOAS which gets a lot of funding from some very important donors. Uh, you know, the FCDO, which is the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, some of you might have known it as DFID, which was uh, the UK's international aid ministry, actually funds some very, very innovative and interesting research across the world. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky to be part of uh, one of those research projects, it's a six million pound project, which primarily works in Nigeria, Tanzania and Bangladesh. I work a lot in Nigeria, but we also work across the globe in Lebanon, in Malawi, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, uh, uh, but but we, we don't just talk about, for instance, um, uh, you know, what is corruption? We, we actually try and talk about what, what evidence there is to ensure that this corruption through a policy can actually be addressed. And then we come back and tell you in class, that's what I mean by this is, you know, we're, we're, we're very research oriented in that sense, action oriented academics. We can come back and tell you from our own research experience on the field, uh, and Harold will talk to uh, his work on climate change, and then you can take away what you want from there. But it's also very, very informed by the kind of tractable, real research that we do. There's some very interesting research for those of you going on uh, interested in sports, in sports and diplomacy. And you know, you might wonder what sports got to do with it. Think about the Chinese Winter Olympics. Think about uh, uh, the, the, the the football World Cup uh, in Oman. Think about how Japan is trying its best to put up its, its best Olympics show in the middle of a pandemic and how it's extremely important for Japan at the risk of athletes to actually uh, uh, sort of um, uh, leverage its, its uh, soft path through the Olympics. So there's a lot, uh, or, or you know, if, if you are cricket fans, it's, it's a rather unfortunate bit of diplomacy between India and Pakistan. I'm a cricket fan. I think we are much the losers for the fact that India and Pakistan don't play anymore, but you know, Sports and diplomacy. Well, well, there you go. Um, so, and and um, we also do very interesting research in that area of sports and diplomacy. Let's say we also have a very interesting program called Scrap, which is on nuclear disarmament. Again, uh, funded by some very interesting organizations, actually including the Vatican. Uh, so, so you can see that we have a myriad of sources. Uh, uh, where we do our research, we, we come with very informed research oriented backgrounds. And I'm going to stop here and let Harold talk about his, his work, his research, and the teaching specifically that we do at uh, uh, CISD. Harold, over to you. Thank you, Pallavi. Um, I will, well, I'm Harold uh, Hiram. I am senior lecturer in global energy and climate policy, and I direct our uh, MSc in this space, both on campus and online. And I'm also director of our global public policy degree in the online space, because as a center, we do a lot of our teaching, not just on campus, but also in online fora. I will speak to that a little bit uh, on, the, on the next slide, even though I didn't put down information on specific online degrees, but a lot of the work that uh, Pallavi referred to earlier that we do with the Foreign Office, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, our Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office it is also through our online spaces where we teach global diplomacy, but not just as a general discipline, as a general degree, but also with very focused streams, focused on the Middle East, North Africa, focused on East Asia, uh, focused on regional and South Asia, on uh, regional uh, um, um, specializations. Um, my own research. Uh, in addition to the teaching, it is built around climate, energy, and sustainability. Of course, that's a very large field. Apart from my role in CIC, I'm also deputy director and co-founder of our Center for Sustainable Finance. I'm currently the climate finance lead for the COP26 University Network. So it's a network of UK universities that advise the government and that uh, input into 
uh, the process to prepare for a successful conference of parties uh, on climate change at the end of the year in November in Glasgow. And uh, in this space, there's also a lot of opportunity for students to engage and uh, some of the current students of the current cohort are working with me and working with the network to try and input into this through a briefing note, uh, as well as through a number of other uh, channels in which participation for students um, is, is possible and desired uh, in, this, in this forum. Um, I have um, some of the recent uh, projects that I've been working on have been for the World Bank and uh, currently for the World Resources Institute, where I look into adaptation, climate adaptation issues, as well as uh, sustainable, resilient infrastructure. There's a World Bank project in the MENA region, so the Middle East and North Africa. And in addition to the MENA region, I have a focus on the Asia Pacific. So that's a module I also teach in uh, this uh, coming year on energy policy in Asia Pacific. So there's a, a lot that we do uh, in uh, a number of different spaces, including in uh, climate sustainability. And really, the climate sustainability agenda, as Anna we already alluded to in her earlier comments, cuts across a lot of these other agendas. The SDG agenda is no secret that uh, the SDGs are now very much focused on climate, energy, and sustainability in ways that the Millennium Development Goals were not. So there's been a clear shift in the agenda of the goals that we have for development, for uh, growth, growth, for prosperity uh, around the world today. And of course, thinking around cultural diplomacy, sport and diplomacy, the sustainability of large sporting events, for example. There are a lot of uh, ways in which uh, climate sustainability intersects with some of the other issues that we're looking at and researching uh, as part of our work our research and our teaching in the center. So I think we can speak of a research-led teaching and to an extent also teaching-led research, which is very beneficial for us. And I think it's very beneficial for you as potential students uh, joining us in CIC. One of the things I wanted to add to this, uh, to this list that, uh, that uh, Pallavi went through at the start and really what we wrote down here in terms of no shortage of diplomatic challenges in the turbulent 21st century is just a selection of issues. There's obviously a lot more that uh, uh, would deserve to be on this list, but we gave you a taste. There's also, not just in terms of the content and what you now need to know uh, as a diplomat, it's also about the way in which you engage diplomatically. Because over the last year, due to the global uh, pandemic, uh, diplomacy and diplomatic engagement has shifted into online fora, has shifted into virtual environments, which makes a lot of diplomatic engagement very difficult. Think about the way we build trust in negotiations, in international diplomacy. You might do so uh, at a conference or a meeting of the parties and the usual diplomatic channels of engagement face-to-face -face contacts. And you pull someone aside and you have a conversation in the hallway and you build an understanding and you meet these people again and again at conferences and, and, and meetings and expert gatherings. But now there's a challenge because you're trying to not just get information across, but also build this rapport and build this understanding in a virtual environment, which is difficult. But there are ways in which it's possible to do so. And those are some of the ways that we're currently thinking through, not just in, uh, in, in the way we teach diplomacy, but also uh, in the way that uh, diplomats will have to engage with each other uh, in an environment that even when we come out of the current situation, COVID-19, we will likely be in a space that relies more on these types of uh, uh, um, um, communication than it did before. So there's a challenge here in addition to, to just the content work that is an exciting field for diplomatic studies and understanding diplomacy in the 21st century by drawing on modern technologies. Uh, on to the teaching. Now, I don't know how I press onto the next slide. Um, how did you do that? How do I read? Do I? You just press slide. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. But I sorry. Was just talking Sarah. about modern technology. <laughs> there I am. Having Sarah, just one quick thing <laughs> before before you go on. I realized that I, I, for some reason, I said that the Football World Cup was in Oman. It's in Qatar. I'm really sorry. Uh, it's the Qatar World Cup. Certainly nothing to do with Oman, but that's it. Yes, Harold, all yours. Well, maybe. In one future year at some point, maybe it'll be in Oman. So uh, there we go, but yeah, Qatar. Um, 
what do we do specifically in terms of our teaching? Pala, we already spoke to some of these elements and I've just written down uh, uh, some information on our two main campus degrees. That's the MAIC, the MA International Studies and Diplomacy. And this degree as our flagship degree because it has the largest number of students on it and it has been around for a long time. Indeed, the first iterations of this degree reach back two decades. So it's been a, a journey uh, for us as a, as a center, as an institution, in terms of diplomatic training and diplomatic development uh, over time. So our focus here is on understanding modern diplomacy in theory and in practice. What I mean by practice is, of course, uh, negotiation and media skills training that is provided to you as part of our, our teaching, not just looking at the various different issue areas like international security, international economics and trade and um, international law and perhaps uh, history and future of the United Nations or sport and diplomacy or sustainability, but also practicing negotiation, uh, uh, mediation, practicing diplomatic uh, challenges in, uh, in these skills building environments. And there's been a challenge for us because uh, transitioning into a virtual only environment is a new uh, a new way for us to try and provide this. So we have uh, um, grown and developed our offerings over the last over the last year. So to adapt to this new challenge, we're hoping very much, of course, that by the time that the new academic year comes around, we're able to fully go back into campus mode. But of course, there might be limitations on our ability to do so. Certainly, when classes reach a certain threshold of student numbers of 30 and above where it might remain in uh, an online forum, but, but this is all subject to, to uh, guidance and subject to potential changes forthcoming in the, in the next uh, several months. So we're hoping that we will be able to return to uh, a teaching mode that, uh, that is tried and tested and that has been running for very many years, very successfully so, training um, current and future diplomats as well as uh, uh, other policymakers um, in this in this space, um, but uh, if not, then it will be a mixed approach that draws both on our ability, uh, established ability on campus, as well as uh, some of those um, um, virtual environments uh, in which uh, negotiation and uh, media skills training is delivered. The other degree is the MSc Global Energy and Climate Policy, which was hibernated for one year this last year due to the crisis and our ability to, to offer uh, the campus training and teaching fully as we had hoped. So we decided to take a break for one year, although we continued in the online space as, it, uh, as we did before. And we're now fully back. Um, we offer here a take on um, the political and economic aspects of the climate emergency and the transition to a low and I should really say zero carbon economy by the middle of the century and the implications that this has for a variety of different policy areas. And the diplomatic, well, diplomatic the skills training arm for energy and climate policy focuses on risk, uh, on understanding risk in policy making, understanding risk investments and different projects on the ground, and on policy analysis. How to write uh, advisory within a uh, government, corporate, not-for-profit context. Uh, to an extent, this is also done in the diplomatic skills training on the MAISD, but the focus in terms of uh, topics and the focus in terms of the level of decision making you look at is somewhat different. Um, more uh, generally speaking, going beyond uh, the focus on, on those two degrees and the units that are specific to those two degrees, we have a broad teaching portfolio. And Pala, we already spoke to this in terms of the approaches we have and the multidisciplinary uh, approaches we take within those individual modules. And we teach uh, not just diplomatic studies and not just climate and energy policy, but international economics, international security, international law, international relations, and indeed a degree such as the MAISD is very much focused on you studying a number of different disciplines and a number of different approaches within this field of global governance or, or, or global studies, as it were, to position you uh, in a way that you can speak to economic debates as much as to legal debates 
and policy debates and uh, international relations. Um, public policy, global public policy is a module I teach, a very, very popular module, which of course looks not just at international dimensions, but also domestic policy developments and, uh, and connects up with a lot of the other modules that we have. And you can study specific topics. So the, the headline items, the cross-cutting modules are the ones I've, I've written down. Those are the ones that have these very particular disciplinary approaches, uh, which you can combine in a multidisciplinary fashion. But then of course, we have a lot of modules that are focused on specific topics and specific issues, including uh, multinational enterprises in a globalizing world, which is returning to our on-campus teaching in 21-22. And this is a module that uh, Pallavi is very familiar with and perhaps uh, wants to speak to uh, a little more after I'm, I'm done. This is a module that uh, approaches uh, multinational enterprises, corporations from both an economic and a legal perspective. So it combines these approaches in a very effective way over the course of the year. Another module that is more specific in focus is energy policy in Asia Pacific, which I teach looking at the Asian century and developments in this pan region as absolutely fundamentally critical for our ability uh, to address the climate emergency in an effective way and to address uh, issues captured in the SDGs, energy access, energy poverty, infrastructure development, etc., in an effective way. Um, there are other modules I already referred to earlier, for example, the study of the United Nations as uh, perhaps our last best hope, and hope that often seems to fail internationally, but is going through a lot of challenges, a lot of development over the last few, few years. The international system, where has it come from? Where does it go over the coming years? Uh, modules such as sport and diplomacy, looking at mega sporting events and their role in diplomatic engagement, uh, um, and a number of a number of other modules too. So uh, I should perhaps add that project management is back in 21-22 as well as another skills module. So for those of you wishing to specialize more onto the economic track and perhaps a more corporate track, uh, um, although not exclusively so, uh, you may wish to combine a number of different skills uh, modules, for example, in risk and policy analysis and project management, in addition to your study of international economics or international law. So there are ways in which you can tailor your degrees and tailor your study and tailor your research that is not entirely possible in the same way in other departments that perhaps are a bit more focused on a specific uh, disciplinary uh, position, uh, be it in um, economics, be it in, in the law school, be it in politics, be it in development studies. You have opportunities there too to choose electives, but the very idea of CISD is this multidisciplinarity and this approach that we encourage not just in your electives, but even in your core modules and the core that makes up uh, the teaching in our, in our courses. Um, so the, uh, the teaching that goes beyond CISD, you're able to choose modules from other departments, uh, from the ones I've just mentioned and, and beyond, for example, there's a very exciting development in Poetry currently around global challenges and global futures, which addresses climate change and other issues. And I'm very much looking forward to adding some of these modules to our electives list, uh, as well as uh, in uh, some of the languages and cultures, arts and humanities uh, subjects that we have. Uh, at SOAS that makes SOAS such an exciting, interesting, and unique place uh, to be and to study uh, in in the 21st century. So. I'm going to leave it at this and then hand it over to Pallavi if you have any further thoughts and comments and things I've forgotten. I'm sure to have forgotten something, but what I wanted to leave you with is this more uh, overarching dimension of the kind of teaching and training that we offer. And I'm very happy to go into detail on specific topics and specific issue areas and specific ways in which we deliver teaching and training and give you a little bit more detail uh, in, in our Q&A. No, Harold, I think that was just pitch perfect. I was uh, actually uh, trying to reply to some of the questions that you had in the chat box. I was typing it out. But I, Kim, Kim what would you suggest? That, that I just speak to them or, or uh, could, you know, wait for a few more questions? Kim, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we can answer this, session, uh, this question now, I guess. And then um, obviously, if more questions come in the meantime, 
uh, then we can also answer those as well. So do feel free to write any uh, questions in the chat box that you can think of that's related to what we've mentioned um, before or any questions that might come to you. Um, so yeah, maybe we can answer this one first. Uh, this is the one about the uh, international politics and the overlaps, right? Harold, do you do you want to take that question? And I can maybe take the one uh, on, the, there was a second one on what's the difference between the MA and the MSc. Yeah. I could leave that. Yes, so I will just, uh, um, this is the one on the international politics or is? Yes. So if, so just to, to, to repeat this, if one is mid-career, looking to retrain, you're not quite sure of your career direction, is it best to choose something like the MSc International Politics? Uh, if you know you want to, or you want to follow a diplomatic route, there is a bit of overlap, that's right. I think in terms of the, uh, both the interdisciplinary approach we take as well as the skills training we offer, there are unique elements to teaching that we offer on the MA International Studies and Diplomacy. In terms of pursuing a diplomatic career, and being exposed to some of the uh, skills and uh, the challenges that you will encounter and deal with in a diplomatic career, the MAISD is very much focused on preparing you for that, on preparing you for this, giving you the skills to, to engage in these sorts of environments. The International Politics MSc is also focused on key issues in this space, but it's perhaps a more theoretical engagement with some of the key disciplines and some of the key topics in this space of international politics, whereas the MA International Studies and Diplomacy offers, in addition to engagement with these core topics, a skills-based element to uh, train the key uh, uh, skills and, uh, important for uh, career in, in diplomacy and expose you to some of the challenges that diplomats face in this space. And this is what we've built for uh, a great number of years. Uh, in terms of our expertise in this area and in terms of our delivery in this area. And that I would say is one of the main uh, um, distinctive elements of the MAISD. So if you want to pursue this kind of career, this may be better for you, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's up to you and it's your choice. Yeah, I mean, I do think it is that that the kind of um, skills that you gain, the skills training that you gain and, and kind of the way the program is both taught but also assessed um, and, and the fact that, I mean, generally speaking at SOAS, um, as well as being academics, there's, it's very much an idea of being a practitioner in the field um, and sort of looking at what is happening in the here and now as well as what has happened kind of historically. So it's that, you know, that um, great kind of mesh, I guess, of in terms of um, having that academic rigour and that academic background, but also being able to then transfer that into um, a field and a career moving forward. Absolutely, I, I agree, yes. So again, uh, as, as I began, it's transferable, but if you want to keep to diplomacy, as Harold said, it gives you those specific skill sets. So it, it really is up to you where you think your interests lie the best, career interests lie the best. We're, we're very happy to give you uh, multidisciplinary teaching, but with skills equipped for diplomacy, so yeah. I can add to that that I think it's important this transferable nature and being a diplomat that operates in a number of different spaces and focused on a number of different issue areas. We, as a center, do capture some of the regional dynamics and the specific issues, but the politics department does so in a, in a more intense way by uh, drawing on the expertise of many of its academics that is not just an expertise in political science or international relations, but an expertise that's also regional in East Asia or South Asia or the Middle East, the politics department does have a great uh, expertise. And that focus can be studied in very specific degrees that are regionally focused. Uh, uh, whereas the MA International Studies and Diplomacy is uh, geared towards a, an international career. It doesn't have to be in diplomacy. It can be in the, in the corporate uh, world or in the non-profit world. Indeed, a lot of our alumni have moved into careers in those spaces, not just in you know, the public sector and in actual uh, diplomatic uh, engagement. But uh, it is for a career where you will move around a fair bit, where you might address a range of different issues from economic concerns and security concerns and legal concerns, and environment sustainability concerns, and yet you're able to speak to them because that's what uh, diplomats, what civil servants, what uh, those working in large corporations uh, and also in smaller 
uh, enterprises do. They address different portfolios over the span of a career. I think that 21st century career is not one where you prepare for uh, uh, working for a lifetime on a very particular issue with a health policy or, or social policy or education policy, but where you actually move around a fair bit and you move around between industries, the public sector, the private sector, not-for-profit sector, to apply those skills. And that's why I think uh, Pallavi very much pointed out, and I would emphasize this, that uh, transferable skills are important in this context. Skills that you take from one of those uh, areas and, uh, and, and disciplines to another, uh, enabling you to succeed in those. And um, I did see that we had another question in which uh, Pallavi, you've uh, kindly answered in terms of what's the typical class size. Um, what we would say is there is a distinction also between um, lectures uh, and seminars as well. So it depends kind of what you're thinking in terms of a, a class. So um, with our lectures, they can be kind of larger lectures depending, and, and some of them can be taken within different degrees. So you might find that actually you have uh, a student who sits within another department who's taking one of the modules as, as their open choices. Um, and then you'll have students who are in the exact same program as you. Um, so those, those can always differ in size, um, but then we do have our seminars or tutorials, which are, are much smaller. Um, and those are really kind of when you're very much kind of interacting and engaging those, they tend to be a little bit smaller with us. So class sizes can differ, um, but it's also interesting to note that you don't necessarily always have the same students in your classes, it can, it can differ, but that also within itself brings in a very interesting perspective because then you have lots of people who come to a particular um, module or a particular class as some might call it, but with very different perspectives and um, viewpoints and kind of reasons for coming to that. So I think it adds all to that kind of flavor of, of the program. I, I would add here, uh, Kim, um, that um, on average, and. You're right, it differs from, from class to class, but on average, our tutorials are, our tutorial groups are around 10 strong. So that's a sort of a, a, of a good measure of how many others will be in a tutorial group. Uh, we don't want it to be too big because then it can be very difficult for everyone to get a word in. And sometimes for students who are perhaps a little bit more shy and not as willing or as used to engaging in, in, in a group environment might, uh, might not feel uh, very comfortable uh, talking, uh, but if the group size is too small, you want to avoid that as well because you want to have a critical mass of engagement uh, within a tutorial to really get to the heart of a debate and invite a number of different opinions and viewpoints uh, informed by your, your reading and, and, and the work that we've done together in class. So we think this is a good, good amount and this is what you will encounter in your, in your tutorials. Usually. And I guess the other interesting point of view is it just doesn't stop just in the classroom itself, um, whether you be an online student or whether you're a student in person as we go back, I think that's one of the kind of key parts of SOAS is that our, our programs are very much interlinked and interconnected, so the idea being that when you leave the classroom, um, you could have just had a, a great lecture on a particular area, you go out into the campus and you have a conversation with another student who doesn't necessarily wasn't necessarily in that lecture isn't necessarily in your program and yet they're able to have a very strong dialogue with you about that because there'll be some aspect of their program which would have touched on that and they may kind of mention something you haven't thought of and it just keeps growing and growing and growing in terms of in terms of your knowledge and in terms of your perspectives and, and viewpoints i wanted to add to that um as a student myself for all in tutorial groups, we're always arguing with one another. It's a good argument, but um, always trying to get our points across. And we've all got strong points to the government. Personally, I'm studying international relations, and I want to follow into a diplomatic route or uh, so working within the UN. And so getting my point across in tutorials is really difficult with such strong-minded people. And even in the lectures, everybody's got a lot to say. So. Um, it's, I wanted to build on that point you made, like we're always talking about with one another about all the things we're learning. Fahima, I just realised we didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself properly at the start. Well, My apologies. Uh, can, can I ask, and then follow, following up on that, um, what made you choose? I mean, yes, you want to work in this sort of environment, but yes. uh, you must have had some particular ideas as to why you choose uh, to. to um, I chose international relations because 
my older sister is she works within the government she's a civil servant and I the work she does she like it really like I see her she's enjoying it I think it's like really meaningful work she's all she's making a difference and you know being of an ethnic minority and being female I want to make that difference I want to um work within the government where other people like myself can have that ability to make that difference and to know that they can work in the government at such a high level so that's why I want to do it I've always been inter interested in politics but I didn't know how to go about it I didn't really want to do the politics side so I chose international relations because I'm more into that history of politics rather than arguing about oh this policy oh let me write this strategy and you know, all of that stuff. And then how have you found it entering into SOAS? So obviously yeah. um, you have lots of opinions and ideas and you've kind of shared that a little bit within talking about kind of those tutorials and those seminar groups, but um, kind of, would you say that coming into SOAS, you were a very kind of confident student or you're a very public speaker or how would you say that's changed over your time with us? Um, as going into SOAS, I was quite, shy because I was like the only one within my school in my friendship group to leave to go to a university university by myself but so has really helped me you know transition from that big step from a level to um university and um being around such a supportive environment such a um people like are so like-minded like you but they're also different in their own ways I'm learning new things every every day whether it be from my uh, peers or whether it be from lecturers and like my professors and like all my professors are so caring and kind to understand that oh if I'm struggling with something or because I've never done international relations before so if I'm struggling with something um at first I was a bit shy so um to be like I don't understand this I don't know what's going on here but your teachers and your peers make you like feel so comfortable that you know um all the time now at first I used to email now I'm like what does this mean? Can you help me on this? And they're all more, more than welcome to help. So that I'm really enjoying SARS right now. I feel like I'm becoming more confident. You wouldn't see me doing, um, helping out like here because I would have been too shy. I would have been like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've been putting myself out there and that's because of SARS. I don't think I would have been able to do that had I gone to another university, had I studied something else. But yeah, SARS has been really great with my transitioning and with my help. So yeah. I mean, thanks a ton because honestly, I mean, you know, people want to listen from you. You're a student. You're the experience. You know, Harold and uh, Kim and me, we can we can talk about our experience, but you're the one that you know comes with the credible sort of answers here. So, so thank you very much for that. And I just wanted to you know quickly ask you so that you know for the benefit of of our audience there, it, you know, you're doing IR. It's a very topical uh, sort of yeah. uh, area of work. I, are you are you also able to therefore relate to what you see outside the campus because that's also something that's very important. And so as you're not just in a classroom, we also try and and help you make those connections between what's going on within uh, academia and outside. What, what would you think about that? Um, definitely, I would say when I go into the classroom, um, obviously done my readings, looked at the lectures and stuff like that, lecture slides, I will go into the class not knowing a clue about what's happening. Um, but once I'm in that class, I'm learning, I'm asking my questions, I come out and I'm so like, get a gun and like a new perspective of everything. Like I never viewed Iran in the way I viewed now because of IR. I didn't see like the, I wasn't aware of like the alliances between Russia and USA and all of the um, nuclear weapon uh, agreements and treaties. And when I go outside, I look at the world differently. I look at my peers differently. Um, and I'm able to talk about um, all the things that we're learning to my peers. And I'm able to take that to um, like when I, I'll be like, oh, I want to learn this. And then I learn more things. And it's just really interesting. And it just like, it makes my mind like boggle how we live in this world and there's so much going on around us yet i did i was i didn't know so that's um but that's what soas is for so is helping me learn new things that i did i didn't know that i that existed so that's my experience of soas always learning new things thank you thank you harold uh or maybe i can just take a quick question the first one that comes up is uh 
is the MA in Global Diplomacy. You've, you've seen it, an online equivalent to this program. Um, uh, Aria, it, I hope I've got your name right. Apologies if I have not pronounced it correctly. Um, so this is more or less an equivalent, but if you look at the, the course structure uh, uh, on the website, some of the options that, that we offer you with the degree are not all available online. So some of the core modules, all the core modules, yes, of course, are offered online, but you, you might want another sort of mix and that particular module might not be offered online. So it really depends on the kinds of modules you want to take. But in terms of the core modules, we offer you both, we offer you both online and, and on campus. I yeah. would add Arabi, to this that there was a difference in the sense that um, some of the modules we offer online are not available on campus. So we have a, a wide range of modules actually online uh, that, uh, that are unique and that offer a very particular take on global diplomacy and that will prepare you uh, in, in, in a very good way uh, for, uh, for this field and for uh, employment in this field as well. Now, the difference being that, as Palavia rightly said, on campus we have certain modules that have been running for a very long time that are perhaps not offered in the same way online, but here you have other modules available to, to make up for that. And of course, we do offer uh, our skills training elements on, on campus and we do not offer those in the same way currently online, but we're working on transferring those options into an online space in the same way, drawing on the experience that we've had of this year of having to deliver in a virtual environment, a uh, skills-based skills -based element. So the degree that you would have at the end uh, of it all is a SOAS degree in much the same way, uh, be it on campus or be it online. Um, but there is some variation in the kind of modules that you could choose and the kind of elements that would make up this degree, but an equally a strong uh, contender for, for, for many because of perhaps the flexibility it offers in terms of doing it from uh, far away. Well, we've done it from far away for this year, but in terms of the structure of, of doing one module after the other, as opposed to the MA International Studies and Diplomacy on campus or the Energy and Climate Policy if you're on campus, which is a more condensed a teaching effort uh, if you do it full time within a year. That's sort of the more traditional and full on student experience, which many of you want, because this is a this is a it's a challenging environment. You do it in a year, you pack a lot of punch with a degree such as this. Whereas for an online degree, perhaps you do it while you're already working in your in your career somewhere in post uh, abroad, and you want to while doing that have the flexibility of adding uh, one module per term. Uh, studying and over a longer period of time, uh, the two years uh, in total, uh, um, minimum for an online degree, to pursue this. So th this is also dependent on what it is that, that uh, the situation you find yourself in and what it is that you want out of an academic education. Yeah, and then I might just quickly jump in and, and answer another question that's come through um, about the MA um, uh, and the possible um, modules that you would choose within it. So I think if you look at the structure, the easiest way to do it, I find, is to um, get yourself like either a Word doc open or even just write it down. And you'll see there's the compulsory classes. And then I just, I would work through list by list if I were you. So you'll see within list B that you have to take a minimum of 45 credits from that list. So I would set that list out first, look at those particular modules and pick out that 45 credits that you want from that. And then what you can do is you can put list C side by side with the open modules list. And then you can look at those and see where you want to get the remainder of your modules from because that's a little bit more open. But what I would say is that we normally run another session later on um, in, in the year. Um, so we, we are looking at probably running it around kind of anywhere between this year it'll be between kind of May and June. We might even run it a couple of times uh, where we'll actually, you know, go through that for you and possibly talk more about the particular modules that are on offer and, and possibly ways in which those modules will differ this year to last year or, or just new things that will be taught as part of those programs. So generally speaking, if you look through the modules, you'll be able to see if this is the kind of program you want to take. And then you have plenty of time as we go through before you register to choose those. Um, and then what I would say is it's a very kind of open policy um, at SOAS. So we always have students who 
select their modules uh, before they started their program. And then in that first two weeks that they're with us, you know, um, sometimes they'll try out different modules. So they'll go to different lectures of, of modules that they maybe haven't even signed up for. And they'll see that there's maybe something that they particularly like in that. And there's always kind of a, a good kind of space of time where we let it kind of sit and sink in and see if that's what you want to take. And, and as I say, there's generally a lot of discussion that happens outside of the classroom in open lectures, um, possibly auditing, though I always do put a caveat on auditing. It's something that we offer at SOAS. Um, we actually offer up you to audit up to 45 credits in a year, but this is a year long program and 45 credits is a huge amount to take on um, in addition to what you're already studying. So I'm always like, let's just try auditing one additional class maybe and see how you get on from that. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of flexibility and you will see that some of, of the modules do overlap with each other. So I think try not to get too worried about adding all of the 15 and the 30 here and this here and this here. You'll have a lot of guidance to that. You'll get a lot of great input with different academic staff. You'll be able to meet different academic staff. I mean, our, our week one of our program is pretty much meeting our staff as opposed to necessarily starting the program as such. So um, I think probably does, I think that's the most systematic way to do it is to write it down or put it in a Word doc, however you best kind of visualize it and go through stage by stage, but also don't feel like you're stuck or, you know, once you've made a decision, you're penned into that in any way. Should we go through some of the other questions, Kim? Some of them might actually, you know, benefit from your, your input. The first one I can see is about career assistance offered to students at CISD and SOAS in general. I think it's from Raj Priya. Yeah, so I mean, in general um, terms, I'll speak in the general terms and then you can probably speak from a department yes. point of view. In terms of general at SOAS, we do have a career service which does have a lot of resources in terms of positions available in the UK, outside of the UK. Uh, they do a lot of transferable skill sets in terms of looking at CVs, looking at, at what people want in different countries in CVs. I mean, I think it varies and some people even call it resume. So it varies from country to country as to what is seen as the right way to do a CV, a wrong way to do a CV, what to include, what not to include. So we kind of take you through that. Um, there can be interview kind of training that you can go through. There's um, a database of different internship um, options that you might want to take up. We do a lot of networking sessions as a whole across SOAS, but even within the departments themselves. Uh, and then of course we have our alumni network, which is very wide ranging. And so if you want to really be put in touch with others who have been through SOAS and who now might be working in the UK or might be working um, further afield, you can do. And then one other thing I'll quickly touch on is the post-study work visa or what is now being referred to as the um, graduate route visa. And so this is a visa that after you finish your studies um, with us, if you're doing a one year master's, then you'll be able to stay in the UK for up to two years after you complete your studies through this graduate route visa. Um, and that could be either looking for work or actually working within the UK. Um, and that doesn't um, need a company to sponsor you as such. So it's a little bit more open in terms of what you could be doing. And then after that, hopefully, after you've secured a position in that time, there'll be lots of other opportunities for companies and organizers to sponsor you after that time as well. Karen, do you want to add? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Pranam, you go ahead. No, 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 you first. Uh, the SCIC, we're running um, dedicated career events as well. Currently, we're in the midst of a careers talk series that we run every week. Uh, with uh, graduates and those uh, former CSD students who've gone on to exciting positions in the public sector, the private sector, not-for-profit roles. I'm chairing a one such session this upcoming Friday um, and uh, two of my students, former students, one who uh, went to, uh, an English student who went to um, work with the international a bamboo and rattan organization in Beijing and is doing some really exciting work around using bamboo as sustainable material for construction and for reducing CO2 footprints, not just in China, but around the world. And uh, one of my former students who's gone on to work for an investment company for 
a transition to a low carbon future and renewable investment. So it's a bit of a private sector and, uh, and a third sector representation, but we could equally have chosen uh, those who currently work in government, uh, two of my former students who work in government, one in the cabinet office currently preparing uh, the climate conference, helping to prepare the climate conference at the end of the year, some very key positions. Uh, so this is what we offer. We draw on our network and we put together those career talks to uh, give you an opportunity when you're with us to meet and, 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 and connect and understand the kind of routes that our uh, uh, graduates have uh, pursued uh, to, to lead them to, to success, as it were, uh, uh, in, in their careers. And, and also perhaps to flag some of the challenges and the things that uh, you should be looking out for um, as, you, as you embark on this, really not just at the end of your studies, but beginning with the day you, you start with us because you know, it's a continuing process and, uh, and we want to involve you and, and make sure that, uh, that, that you are, are set. Uh, afterwards for, for, for this glorious, uh, glorious career. Hello, me. And uh, to, just to add to what uh, Harold said, you know, some of you uh, did raise the, the issue of transferability. Can we just be diplomats? One of my students will be coming in at the end of this month. She is working for the Department of Home. Uh, so we, we try and give you a sort of all round uh, view into what it is to move out of CISD. You don't always have to be in international jobs. Working for the civil service in this country uh, can also be very, very rewarding. Uh, it's it's very merit based. So you know, there's there's been a move straight from her ISD degree into the Department of Home. You couldn't have had for you know asked for a more sort of uh, uh, opposite facing career, but but there she is, and she's she's using all her skills. And we also encourage students to share not just what they took from CISD, but also their personal and transformative experiences. You know, Fahima talked about uh, uh, being minority ethnic female. And these are the kind of stories we actually champion out there. So some of our students, in fact. My student who's coming in at, at, at the end of March, she's also had a similar trajectory. So we also encourage these kinds of experience sharing because we understand careers is not just the technical professional part of it. There is also a lot that goes along with it in, the, in terms of how you can actually move away from the campus, which is fairly sheltered, to the world that's outside. So yeah, I'll stop there. I mean, I mean what I would add as well is even this year where we haven't been on campus, there's been a lot of um, opportunities for our students. So. Um, it could be working with us as a student ambassador um, on a number of different events that we're having. We also um, have a global challenges conference um, coming up where actually some of our um, students are also talking on that amongst our academic staff and also um, guests coming in from outside. So they get to share their ideas, their perspectives on a range of different topics. So it's really how much you want to get involved. And then even outside of at SOAS, we are known as a university of activists, but I think that that means so much more than what first comes to mind. I think when you first think of activism, you think of student protests, and which of course does happen, um, and we, we support it. We support our students in getting involved in student protests, albeit of a peaceful and nonviolent nature, um, but it goes beyond that. It's about building dialogue. It's about educating people um, at all different levels on different perspectives and ideas, and it's about having sometimes some very uncomfortable conversations, um, but that's kind of what we allow our students to do. So we have over 200 different student societies. And what I would say is when you compare it to maybe other universities where sometimes the student societies are more of a sporting nature or more of a kind of hobbies and interests, even though we do have that, what you'll tend to find through our different societies is there's very much a major theme running through them, which is about social change. Um, and that's kind of what you see at SOAS. So there's so much more than just um, what is in the programs and what we as um, the kind of academic um, and professional services staff offer you. It's really about what our students offer you. Um, there were a couple more questions. Kim, should we? Um... Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's one about the, the difference between the MA and MSc titles at SOAS. Now, I, I don't want to talk for all, all uh, you know, uh, degree titles at SOAS, but uh, at CISD, certainly, for instance, when we, we do run the uh, MSc, 
in global corporations and policy. It also has to do with the fact, and, and, and Harold can speak to GCP, his, his, his program. It is fairly uh, uh, economics focused, which is why it, it's, it's, it's basically the, the, the sort of analytical background, the disciplinary background that we look at. And since global corporations and policy is not just focusing on, let's say, policy analysis, but actually gives you economic theory and economic frameworks to work with, it is called a master's in science, therefore. Harold, if you want to talk to your program. Yeah, so similar to an extent, I mean, we do uh, incorporate a lot of economic dimensions uh, in our study here at the Embassy Energy and Climate Policy, but also the engagement with uh, uh, large data sets and quantitative analysis uh, when it comes to energy, when it comes to some of the statistics that we'll be looking at. So it's a methodological aspect as well that comes, comes into play that does not mean that the degrees and the degrees we offer at the center are you know, only accessible to those who have a strong background in quantitative analysis or kind of metrics. That's not the case. We make it very accessible and we're not going to draw ext extensively on this, but we, we do teach and we do approach this in recognition of the fact that to have a rounded and, uh, and, uh, and a good understanding of energy and climate policy and uh, what might be possible in your engagement in this space in future, as well as corporations and policy and uh, some of the economic approaches that Pallavi champions uh, requires you to understand some of these dimensions too and requires you to be able to access those materials and, and draw on specific methodologies and I think that's a that's a, a slight difference uh, that leads us to 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 have this classification but uh, but uh, apart from that um, we we offer a teaching and training that is uh, um, drawing on on very similar approaches across the board. And um, I think there is, yes, uh, Ronak's question on following a degree from CISD, will I be able to apply for the British Foreign Service, which is working at the FCDO? Um, I don't know, Kim, I think your, your best place to answer that. You could apply to the former DFID, which was international development, but I am not sure if you can become foreign and Commonwealth Office cadre. That I am not sure about. Kim, do you do you have an idea there? It, um, I mean, it, it tends to depend on the post and kind of um, each post may have different kind of aspects to it. So um, there will definitely be some way in which you can join possibly a part of um, the British Foreign Office, but there will be certain posts that would not be accessible to that. So you, it's something that you would look at, but again, through our careers services through our academic staff and their links through our alumni. Um, these are different areas that you can explore uh, within your time with us. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times you do see, okay, you, people know the British Foreign Office, but they might not know all of the different organizations and all of the different kind of players, if you will, that come into effect with that. And that's part of the process of coming to an institution like SOAS is to understand how many different people are involved in a process and what role you might want to best take up within that. I think that's a very critical point. I wanted to just speak on that very briefly, if I may, because what we see, <clears throat> so when, when, when you come at a problem like energy and climate or international development, some of the organizations, some of the key players you might have heard of are large oil and gas companies or large renewable companies, Dong and Vestas or BP and Shell. But there is an enormous field out there of some smaller to medium sized companies, lobby groups, research foundations uh, that, uh, that operate in these spaces that all provide opportunities uh, for a career going forward, especially if I take my own field, sustainability, environment, social governance, ESG. Uh, uh, resilience, climate mitigation, adaptation, such an enormous uh, um, um, amount of opportunities that have developed in the last few years, thousands upon thousands of potential directions you could take. So it's important to move away from what we might have heard and we might all want to work for Apple and Google or Facebook, or maybe not, uh, when you come to service, maybe you don't want to work for those, but, uh, but to actually look at who else is out there uh, and the opportunities that you might be able to pursue in this space. And that's exactly what the students uh, on our programs and other programs across SOAS have done and the extremely interesting careers they have pursued in these spaces. Yeah. 
And I think it's even interesting to reach out to our academic staff because as I say, we are a university of practitioners as, as much as we are a university of, of academics and those two can go very much hand in hand. They don't have to be separate from each other. And what you'll find is if you speak to a lot of our uh, academic staff, they're saying, well, actually I work on a policy advisory board in this area, I um, advise on this area, and these are all things that they get involved in throughout their careers. It, it actually helps shape their careers and he helps shape the areas that they then go on to do research in. It's, when you look at um, different academic staff that we have, you'll see that over time, there's just not this one narrow kind of view that they're, they're working in. They've, they've done lots of different research in lots of different regions and lots of different areas, and it kind of grows as they as they um, work within academia, but also as they work in different policy setting um, initiatives. I think there's one more question on research resources and facilities. I'll very quickly answer that and then, then leave because uh, I, we're probably running short on time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll quickly answer that and leave Harold and Kim, Kim to round that off. Research facilities, Rajpriya, the SOAS library, you can just get lost there and not come out of the library for, uh, you know, you can do about three masters and you still wouldn't go through what we have in the library. It is it is genuinely a national resource. It is, it is actually one of the libraries recognized in, in, in this country as such, and uh, the online and electronic resources that you have are absolutely fantastic. Maybe Fahima, you've got something to add to that. Hopefully you found mostly whatever you were looking for uh, from, from the electronic journals. Uh, you know, while, while in SOAS, you can also have access to uh, very interesting media publications like the Financial Times, which if you are a, you know, going to study to be a diplomat or work in climate change or multinational corporations is extremely helpful. So you also get access to a lot of media resources. Um, you can you can talk to professors and lecturers who are actually researching, you know, Harold's climate change research, my research on multinational corporations uh, separately and anti-corruption uh, across developing countries very se separately. There's that that avenue. And of course, the one thing that you take away as your own uh, in, in not just in, CI, in CISD, but also at SOAS is your dissertation. It's literally your baby as when you come, come in to do your master's uh, uh, here at CISD and SOAS. It's what you spend 15,000 words in about six months of your life in, in CISD at formulating what you want to research and what, what you know, keeps you up at night, let's say. And we, we give you the resources to actually fulfill that, that, that ambition of this keeps me up at night and these are the answers for it. So I'm, I'm going to stop here just, just to say that if you are intellectually curious, you will find the resources here practically as well as you can catch hold of lecturers. Well, online or, or, or you know in the corridor and pick, pick their brains but there is enough to satisfy satisfy all of that practically as well as intellectually yeah great well i mean i thank you all for coming along to the session we have overrun slightly so i thank you all for your time and whether it's the daytime evening nighttime there uh, thank you for coming along um, do feel free to watch this back when we send out the links and do feel free to come to any of the other events that we host and again thank you to Harold thank you to um, to Fahima and uh, th yeah thank you all for coming to this event and hopefully this was Hello, helpful you. to oh yeah sorry <laughs> sorry yeah sorry <laughs> and thank you all like hopefully it was helpful to you you learn a bit more about our programs a bit more about the university um, in in general um, and hopefully it's interested you to learn more about us to hopefully come to our programs but do feel free to engage with us more um, through the website um, we do have um, also chats that you can have with our current students and so just feel free to ask as many questions as you can thank you everyone and good evening good night <laughs> good afternoon <laughs> thank you bye thank you bye